afternoon, everyone. We are here for Lower East Side History Month with Katie Vogel, public historian for the Henry Street Settlement. Uh, today, she's going to share with us history of the institution, but also importantly, uh, the, the story of one of the co-founders of Henry Street Settlement, Lillian Wall. Uh, hopefully, you've had a chance to review Henry Street Settlement as an LGBT historic site on the project's website. We're going to talk a little bit outside, and then Katie's going to treat us to a little glimpse inside. So thank you, Katie, for being with us. Yeah, thank you. So we're here at Henry Street's historic headquarters, which has been the headquarters of the settlement since 1895. So that's two years into our founding. We were founded in 1893. And it is still our headquarters for the settlement today. So we're not just a historic site, and we're, we're not just a history museum. We are an active social services agency in the present day. And this is one of our sites. It's our administrative headquarters out of 18 sites that make up Henry Street now. And Henry Street serves over 50,000 New Yorkers every year in healthcare, social services, and the arts. And so we're mostly going to be talking about our origin story um, starting you know, in 1893 and at the turn of the 20th century with Lillian Wald. And um, and I just wanted to mention that you know we're still an active social services agency now, and our um, president and CEO David Garza uses our is really in inspired by our history and uses our um, history as a blueprint for making decisions in the present day. So our history is still very much alive and well at Henry right. Street as well. Excellent. And so, if you would as a Found, or a found, foundational kind of setting the stage. So we're in front of 265. Yep. This is one of a series of row houses, 263 through 267, right? And then also our firehouse at the end of the block, which was recently acquired by Henry Street from the uh -huh. city and is now our neighborhood resource center. But these buildings, they were built in slightly different years, but all around 1830. So they're some of the oldest buildings that are left in the Lower East Side neighborhood. Um, they were built as single-family row houses and built for rich families when this was a wealthy area of the city. And a lot of these types of buildings were torn down to make room for tenement buildings as the city started really rapidly changing in the late 1800s um, due to immigration being at an all-time high at that point. So the city at the turn of the 20th century was rapidly industrializing and becoming more and more urban. And the Lower East Side was the most crowded neighborhood in the world at the mm. turn of the 20th century. And so that's really where Henry Street's origins come from, is to be a place to serve the neighborhood, which was a mostly immigrant community, and to provide direct services, and to fight on behalf of low-income people and an, a mostly immigrant community. As part of a larger, what was called settlement house movement in New York City, that Lillian Wald was a part of. So what that term means is basically reformers settling into mostly immigrant or low-income neighborhoods and providing direct services at a time when the government was not providing any kind of safety nets like that. And in New York City, um, do you have a sense of how many settlement houses there may have been at any kind of given time at the height of yeah. uh, this uh, form of community outreach and support? How many did New York City have to serve its communities? Well, so when Henry Street was founded, or right around the time Henry Street was founded, there were six settlement houses in the United States. And most of those were right here in New York and in the Lower East Side, again, it being the most crowded neighborhood in the world at that time. And by 1910, there were about 400 settlement houses in the United States, and a lot of those still in New York. So it really was a whole movement that Lillian Wald was a part of. And Lillian Wald uh, was trained in public health, correct? I mean, she was a nurse. Mm -hmm. She really was a pioneer in terms of having that expertise and bringing it into communities in need. Right. She was a trained nurse, and she also was enrolled in medical school when she decided to start Henry Street, but she didn't finish medical school um, because Henry Street took, um, <laughs> took all of her time, so she decided to dedicate her life to that work. But she's known as the pioneer um, of public health nursing, and she coined that term. And um, she led a team of visiting nurses who would go into people's homes to, to take care of residents of the Lower East Side, and that nursing service expanded out all over the city. 
And basically what they're doing is breaking down barriers to accessing health care and providing free and affordable health care to the community. And um, this is a time when, um, you know, a lot of the sanitation issues and public health issues were being blamed on the individual and on low-income communities. And um, there was a lot of fear around immigration and a rising um, anti-immigrant sentiment, rising eugenics movement. So uh, Lily and Wald really emphasized taking that onus off of the individual and off of a community and looking at all of the structural um, and environmental factors in place that um, can help public health and that can help um, communities be healthier. And certainly, you know, Lillian Wald doesn't do it alone, right? Who were some of the other people who she worked alongside with, whether it be other um, public health professionals or even her philanthropic supporters who helped finance this kind of a project? Can you tell us a little bit about all the other people that were involved? Yeah, so she was part of a whole movement of people who were working at this time. Um, it's known as the Progressive Era Reform Movement. So her main benefactor was a man named Jacob Schiff who donated this building, 265, to um, be the permanent home of the settlement. Um, Lillian Wald had a whole team of people who were working here with her, so who she was deeply influenced by, who I'll talk more about um, as we go. Um, and also, I know many people know the name Jane Adams. Mm -hmm. She was very close to Jane Adams, who was a settlement house worker in Chicago. They were lifelong friends, and they were among um, the settlement house workers who were really on the very progressive end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. especially around talking about issues of race and racism. Well, I will follow you if you want yeah. to show us any more exterior or if it feels like it's the time to go in. Let's go ahead and head in and we can just briefly look at the exhibit that we have in our headquarters and then I can take you through some of the rooms All right. and I'll talk a little you. bit more about queer history in particular. All right. contributions like being um, the person who founds a school lunch program in New York City and pioneers special education classes in schools and puts the first school nurse in a public school and starts the first public playground here on the Lower East Side, the first in the whole United States. Is this a permanent exhibition or is this for your recent anniversary year? So yeah, we had an anniversary um, three years ago for our 125th, but this is permanent. So uh, Monday through Friday, uh, people can come and visit um, and look around for free. Excellent. I see a couple of interesting objects. Do you mind just maybe yeah, pointing sure. out some of those? So uh, this is one of the nurses' bags, one of the real bags from around 1920. This is given to us by MetLife Archives. And um, MetLife Insurance Company actually at, at one point started to fund the nurses, thinking about preventative care mm -hmm. around public health. And let's see, we have some, some things throughout yeah. the exhibition, but uh, let's look at this picture of Lillian Wald here. It's a picture of her at her graduation from nursing school. What school did she graduate from? The New York Hospital Training School for Nurses. Has that evolved into something else that exists still today? Does yes, it... uh, Cornell University okay. Nursing School. Um, and this is her nursing pin that she was awarded. And I don't know if there's good enough light on this, but can you see this picture up yeah. here? So this is a picture of... Um, you know what, I have this one. You sent this exactly. one to me ahead of time. Share it. Great. Yeah, 
Yeah, so this is a picture of um, who Lillian Wald called her family, and she uses family with a capital F. And these are people in this photo who were lifelong friends and confidants of Lillian Wald, and many of them lived at the settlement for decades. And also, we do know of a few romantic relationships that she had with women who helped her run the settlement. So there are, so Lillian Wald at this time period, at the turn of the 20th century, did not identify as queer or lesbian or gay because those terms didn't mean the same things that they do now. But we do know of these romantic relationships through love letters that were uncovered by a historian named Blanche Wiesen Cook in the 70s. And Blanche Wiesen Cook has been so instrumental in me personally learning about this queer history of Henry Street. Um, this is a, you know, an alternative family structure that Lillian Wald created for herself, right? And I think it's not just a detail of her life that she had these romantic relationships with women. It is really foundational to Henry Street's origins because these were the people who created all of these amazing programs that went on here at Henry Street. Okay. And I can talk a little bit more about the relationships if you'd like. But. And in this photo, which one is um, Lillian? She is right here in the center, right in the center. Point again, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. sure, I'm right here in the center. Right, great. That's Lillian Wald. And then a lot of the other people in this photo are, again, people who lived at the settlement for, for years. But none of the people in this photo are the ones that we know about who she had romantic relationships mm -hmm. with. But again, these are the people she called her family with a capital F. Mm -hmm. All right, so do you want to go upstairs? Let's, please. So for folks watching, definitely feel free to drop questions in the comments and Katie, I'm sure will be happy to answer. Yeah, definitely. We are heading to the backyard. I can close this behind me? Yeah, that's fine. This is our beautiful backyard right behind 265, the original building, the original headquarters. And when Lillian Wald lived here, this was used as a playground for neighborhood kids. And kids would line up down the street waiting to get into this playground. It was very popular. And in the mornings, there was an informal kindergarten, and then um, kids would come after school with their younger siblings. And at night, it was used as a space where um, labor organizers in the neighborhood had a place to meet. Mm. So Lillian Wald was very involved in the labor movement and um, and on kind of on the fringes of the socialist movement as well. But she used this playground as a blueprint to advocate to the city government to build public playgrounds in New York. Mm -hmm. Again, there were zero public playgrounds in the United States at this time. And so Wald helped to advocate for Seward Park, which is around the corner mm -hmm. from here, and um, eight other public playgrounds in low-income neighborhoods. And um, her thinking around this had public health implications, but I'll just, also just the idea that kids should be able to have a full childhood and be able to run around mm -hmm. and play especially thinking about this at a, at a time when kids were laboring in the garment factories. Of course, yeah. All right, we can go back inside if you're ready. Yeah. Well, actually, why don't we take a step and we're, we're behind which number, I'm sorry? Uh, 265, and we'll go up to this space, but this is Wald's bedroom. Oh, okay. And a beautiful porch that looks down onto the garden. Perfect.
what would they call this? Just the common room? Did it have any kind of the internal? Room. Room? Okay. <laughs> and a lot of the features in here are original, and they were restored in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And we have a portrait of Wald over here. This space is most famous for being the first place that the early civil rights organization, the NAACP, had their first meeting in, oh. this, in this room. So May of 1909, there was a conference in New York that led to the founding of the NAACP, and they had their first meeting here in this room. Is that in part because of Lillian's just engagement on social issues in a very broad sense? Yes, and again, um, I mentioned before with you know working with Jane Addams, uh, a lot of settlement house workers were not engaging in trying to dismantle racism, um, but Lillian Wald was a part of that, and so was um, Jane Addams. So people like W.E.B. E. Du Bois would have been here for um, the founding, and Ida B. Wells, who was mm -hmm. a journalist. So world leaders came to Henry Street <laughs> to engage in issues of public health and social reform and civil rights. And, <clears throat> pardon me, can you, I mean, beautiful, beautiful details, and you said it's been restored. Um, what is Henry Street Settlement's approach to um, preservation and, of, and stewardship of the building? Yeah, we do have a preservationist who's on staff who works with facilities, um, Maggie Oldfather, and she knows so much about this building, <laughs> and so does Renee Epps, who runs the facilities team. Um, and they've led um, a lot of the restoration efforts, especially the outside of the building, which was um, the, the iron work was recently done. And um, so they know all about all of these details, but um, it's, it's difficult because it's an active social services agency, right? We're not just a historic site, so it's a balance of preservation, but also really making use of the space in the present day. So let's head up to Lillian Wald's bedroom. I'm just going to get a picture or a look at that portrait. Crossing through 267 to 265. Yeah, and what you see here is this hallway was added to combine the buildings together. This is the original back of 265. room. It's a meeting space because, as I've mentioned, this is a building that's still very much in use today for the settlement. Mm -hmm. So it's not just every room preserved. It is actually in use. And it's very modest in scale and size it is. for somebody with her responsibilities and stature in her community and in her profession. Yeah. One of my favorite parts of the building, too, this porch that I showed from the outside, but if you want to take a look up here, too. Show you next 
Perfect segue for your question, because we're going to go to the nurses' bedrooms up on the top floors of the settlement. So you can follow me this way. changed around as the settlement has gone through different uses over time and needed the spaces for different uses. But all of these rooms up here would have been the nurses' bedrooms, but I'll show you one that is still the same size as the original bedrooms. The individual room uses may have changed, but has the layout also changed in terms of walls moving and things? A lot of the yeah. spaces, yes. But this one is an original size of a nurses' bedroom right here, and it's someone's office. We don't know if one or two people shared a room. Well, to that question, what about furnishings? I mean, if there had been a single bed, a bunk bed, those kinds of things, what kinds of furnishings or other items from within the space have been preserved over time? Yeah, nothing, not, not really a lot of furniture, yeah. but when we were in the dining room, you may have seen um, the samovars, the, mm -hmm. the um, tea, um, and then also the candlestick holders as well. Those were gifts from Wald's neighbors who came to visit the settlement. So, and then I, also, I saw the same. I'm yeah. so sorry to interrupt. I saw a samovar in the exhibition as well. Yeah. Is there a significance to those, to those you know items in terms of them being widely used? Well, so we don't know who exactly gave them to Wald, but they would have been a gift from. Um, one of her Russian Jewish neighbors, and this was in when she lived here at the turn of the 20th century. It was mostly a community of Jewish people from Eastern Europe and the Russian Empire, and also um, Southern Europeans. Those would have been the main immigrant groups here. Nooks and crannies, nooks and crannies. So yes, a maze-like building. <laughs> we'll head back down, and we can take some questions. Are we on the third floor right now or second floor? We're on the third floor. Third floor, third floor 265. We're back in 265. <laughs> or no, we're in 267. <laughs> I'm sorry, I still get confused too. Lillian Wald is such an underrecognized figure and you know I think through through my work I'm really trying to um, gain more awareness of all of the amazing work that she did here at Henry Street that touches especially us as New Yorkers our daily lives as I mentioned the public playground school nurses school lunch program um, it's just it's pretty endless as I'm here longer it just continues to unfold how much um, amazing work she did. Is um, what what is the existing um, public outreach that, that the settlement does, just in terms of its own institutional history, the history of public health, etc. Do you have school groups that come regularly? Do you go into public schools? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, we do have school groups who visit, and a lot of nursing students and social work students. Those are really the main groups that I give tours to. Um, and I've been doing all virtual tours this past year. But um, also, I really love giving tours to Henry Street 
staff and clients. And that's something that I want to do even more of because I think having this connection to our history in the present is, I, I know for me, it's, I know I'm the historian, that's my job, but it's, it's such a special connection to know you're part of this legacy here. And you were telling us a little bit before about the family, capital F, the, yeah. the people that uh, she surrounded herself with and lived her life with. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the imprint they, they've left here at, at Henry Street in terms of um, you know, your, your, your approach to marginalized communities, for example. Yeah. Just tell us a little bit about how that, I think you, you brought it up already, so sorry if you're repeating yourself, no, but just a little okay. bit again about how that really is at the core of the organization still today. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, I think, you know, Lillian Wald talked about you know, and this is a criticism of the settlement house movement of coming of people who were from privileged backgrounds coming to low income neighborhoods and, um, you know, imposing their middle class values onto the community that already existed. And that's something that Lillian Wald was really actively against. And she talked about, you know, she wanted to come and she uses this phrase, lend her citizenship to the community, basically lend her privilege as someone who was born in the United States and who grew up in a wealthy home. And um, she talks a lot about just listening to the community and what are the needs and what's already going on here and how to, to support that rather than to just come in with your own ideas. And that's something that our president today still really emphasizes and, um, you know, to deeply listen <laughs> to the community and um, find out what the needs are. Um, in, in a way that's not, you know, imposing your values, so. And do you see, um, for, within the medical profession, the public health profession, do you see, or do we see some of the principles and um, tenets that guided Lillian Wall's work? Are those still, um, do we still guide people in public health yeah. today? Yeah, that's, I really love giving tours to nursing <laughs> students and social work students because the origins of public health nursing is right here. Um, and, you know, when I give tours to nursing groups, they talk about, oh, my community health class those, and public health class, those are still things we're talking about now. And, um, you know, Lillian Wald was influenced by people like Florence Nightingale. She's not the first person to address environmental factors, but she's really, she's the one who really coins that term public health nursing and, and does it in this way of really this organized community effort and going beyond nursing and integrating social work. And so this is the origins of social work as well. So it's when a pretty we cool were, connection. When we were in the dining room, you mentioned that the NAACP met, was founded here. Mm -hmm. um, what, other, um, what other activities, causes or otherwise, what else filled Lillian Wall's life besides Henry Street alone? I'm sure very dynamic woman with lots yeah. of interests. What other causes did she engage in or even outside of her activism? Tell us a little bit about her as a person, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So in terms of, I mean, she was involved in all facets of activism, um, labor movement, suffrage movement, um, fighting for the rights of immigrants and African Americans, but that was all connected to Henry Street. I think really her whole life was connected to Henry Street. Um, but in terms of her personal life, um, to go a little bit more into the queer history part of what we were talking about, you know, um, this community that she set up here was mostly women, so she surrounded herself with women. It's, it really, as far as I know, it was all women who were actually living on site. And I actually wanted to read this quote because um, I think it sums it up really well from Blanche Wiesen Cook, who's a historian. Um, she says, you know, this was a homosocial world that was also erotic. Her primary emotional needs and desires were fulfilled by women, and she was women supported and women allied. And so I think that's really getting at, you know, this was, this was her community that she chose, right? Um, and I think that from the outside, a lot of people wouldn't have viewed um, these women that way and would have seen them as people who were unmarried, maybe not by choice and maybe lonely, um, but they weren't. They had this very active life here. Um, with and intention. Right? With intention, <laughs> yeah. And I found this really amazing poem when I was um, going through her, le her letters. 
um, it was tucked into a letter from Mabel Hyde Kittredge, who was one of her partners for a short time. And um, I don't know if Mabel Hyde Kittredge wrote it, but it was tucked into her letter. And I want to read just the first part um, because it's so playful, too. So um, it's, the poem was called The Caller. And the first paragraph C -A -L -L is C-A-L-L or C-O-L-L? C-A-L-L-E-R. Busy, who said I was busy? Walk right in, of course you can. Here's the parlor, dine in the next room. Yes, all women, no, no men. Yes, we like it. Pray excuse me, but I think the doorbell rang. And then it goes on for much longer, but I just really love that. And when I found that, that poem, I was just so excited because I think it, you know, I think it addresses the, the, the playfulness, right? And that they were, they were friends and romantic partners. And again, as you, as you said, something, this is the life that they chose. So we're on the tail end of, with it being May, not only is it preservation month, it's also Lower East Side History Month and going to June, of course, is Pride Month. So uh, does Henry Street Settlement um, do anything in connection with Pride to um, really make sure that people are familiar with, aware of William Wald as um, a lesbian reformer? Yeah, so this year I'm going to be leading a queer history walking tour of the Lower East Side with a few of my amazing colleagues um, who I used to work with at the Tenement Museum um, and then one of my friends who works at Blue Stockings Bookstore. And so we're putting together all of our knowledge and writing a queer history of the Lower East Side tour. I am not aware that one exists, so I was actually looking for one that I could offer as an opportunity for staff at Henry Street to go on, and I couldn't find one. And I asked as many people as I could, but um, I don't think there is one, so we're going to write our own. There will be soon. Yeah. <laughs> so that will actually be in July, um, just because we needed a little bit more time <laughs> to write it, but um, we will start advertising it a bit during um, Pride Month and one of the tours will be for staff and one will be open to the public. Katie, thank you so, so much for spending so much time with us and walking yeah. us through, I mean, having the chance to see the spaces that really where all of this important work um, took place and where Lillian spent so much of her time, lived her life, is really impressioning. I mean, it's, it really helps you connect even that much more deeply to her story and the history. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any, any final, any final facts that we should know about, or we can uh, always tell people to head to the comments and ask any other questions that come along. Yeah, and also I've said this a few times, but we still exist today. We're not just a historic site. So if you want to know about all of Henry Street's programs, which are extremely vast, just go to Henry Street's website at henrystreet.org. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you.